taste in everything from music to art may be subjective, but it's also much more complicated than that. Tom Vanderbilt is author of You May Also Like, Taste in an Age of Endless Choice, and he joins us for a look at how your preferences in pop culture and beyond both reflect and shape you. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you. Great to be here. It's nice to have you back. Um, so today we're going to talk about how taste informs our preferences in music and culture. How did taste uh, come to be intertwined with our identity? Yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. I mean, I, th I think one thing that happened in uh, kind of society, I'm taking a very long, you know, big picture view here, mm -hmm. is that, you know, you used to have sort of a simple, you know, kind of feudal society, right? You had the, the nobles on top and sort of the peasantry below. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the nobles liked one thing and everyone else liked something else. As more people began to have more money, you sort of had emerging middle class, industrial revolution. More people had access to more things. So you sort of, they started buying the same things. I, the question of identity then becomes a little more blurred. How are, if we're all sort of alike, humans don't really love to be, we love to be a sort of a certain, uh, have a certain similarity with other humans, but we always want to be a little bit different. It's been called uh, conformist distinction. So we want to find this happy medium between being just a little bit special and being like everyone else. So if, if, you know, if everyone can buy the same thing, where do you find, how do you find this difference? So that's where kind of certain tastes began to emerge where you know, a, a minor like change to your jacket or something would indicate some social uh, difference. And I, I find this today, flash forward now to 2016 in a place like Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. where I live and you go to order a coffee at the kind of local, you know, coffee shop, the artisanal, uh, you know, kind of hipster coffee place and, and you feel a little bit intimidated. You're not quite sure, you know, what, whether the thing you're ordering is the right thing to order, mm -hmm. what it even is. Um, there's always some new preparation you don't know about because some new group has decided we don't want to drink that coffee that everyone else is drinking. We need to distinguish ourselves a little bit more. So the distinctions have gotten, you know, pretty fine. And things that used to be like everyday objects mm -hmm. can now be treated almost kind of like these luxury goods with people, you know, what, what you choose really has, seems to say something about you. Cell phones, right? <laughs> That's a big one. Um, but um, I want to talk to you about art. Um, to what extent is there a correlation between one's social class and their taste in art? I mean, I think all taste is somewhat linked to social class. I think that used to be a much stronger connection, though. And, and now we had something emerge in the last few decades that was been referred to as cultural uh, omnivorousness, where you know people were no longer tied into these categories of highbrow and lowbrow. You know, you could, only, you could only like opera, but you couldn't like this other thing. Mm -hmm. And now it became more in, sort of more interesting and more compelling to just find what was good in all sorts of genres and not you know sort of limit by the art form or you know the genre, but you know kind of kind of free range across all these uh, sorts of things. So you could be into opera and hip hop and this and that and, and not, not simply discount something. So it's become a little bit harder, I think, to, to tell you know, where someone is coming from. But more so than money, the argument has always been it's, it's one's education that is the strongest kind of influencer of, um, of social taste. But the thing I'll say, you know, the, the, the key takeaway here is that, that you know, taste is very predictive of, of who you are and who you hang out with. And they've done studies looking at you know, people's Facebook likes, and you can really infer a lot about that person just th with a computer algorithm. Um, you know, their sexual orientation, uh, gender, race, political affiliation, all sorts of things, just from just from the likes. I mean, it doesn't always work. Some people, you know, people are always, uh, you know, ha have individual taste, but you, you can do a, a lot of um, finding out of about a person from from these, you know, what they're displaying on Facebook without knowing anything actually about that person. In your book, you write about, um, I guess the ebbs and flows of art in the art world, mm -hmm. how at one point in history, certain art was considered you know, great, and then other parts of history, it wasn't considered great. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the late, late 19th century, the paintings that were selling for the most money uh, are now today almost forgotten. The work that was considered very controversial, that was considered not to be art at the time, was something like the Impressionists, who are now selling for their work sell for several hundred millions of dollars. You have blockbuster shows, people lining up the door. So, I mean, the, the, the thing here is that, that tastes always change, and it's really impossible to predict in any moment what is going to last from the current moment. Are, are the tastes we have right now going to be projected 10 or 20 years from now? It's, it's just impossible to say, I think, on, bo on both a personal and a social level. I find myself, personally, sometimes, if I go to the museum or to the art gallery, it's different, I guess, some people might be drawn to 
a, a, a piece and mm. other people might not be drawn? Do you think language? Yeah, I mean, and of course, the, the key thing there you said is like mm -hmm. you've gone to an art museum or a gallery, mm -hmm. and that that's right away you're sort of being predisposed to think about what's inside that gallery or museum in a certain way. It, it is art, and you are probably supposed to like it if they've decided to show it in this gallery. There was a great experiment done in, in Belgium on, on the street. They took a famous Belgian artist and, and had him paint a work on a street, on a kind of a wall in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. And they then interviewed all these people in the art world and they said, oh, yeah, of course, if people see this work by Luke Toymans on the sidewalk, they're going to stop and look at it because he's a famous artist, he's a great artist, this is great art he's doing. They track this alleyway for about 24 hours. A lot of people walk by and hardly anyone stopped to look at it because they, they weren't expecting to look for art. They didn't know it was art. So, I mean, the point here is that a lot of what we think about art is because we've been told something mm -hmm. is art, which comes with this whole set of expectations, mm -hmm. and um, without that, you know. But the, the, they've done brain studies, you know, if, if you simply, like this glass by your side here, if, if, I, if someone tells me that's art, look at that, your brain actually kind of reacts in a different way versus, hey, look at that glass of water. I mean, they're, they're, it, you almost have to put yourself in a different set of shoes to, to, to think about art and have what they call, you know, an aesthetic experience. We have an image here of French artist Marcel Duchamp's fountain. Um, what makes it art to some and a urinal to others? Yeah, I mean, that's a great quote. I like that, that the art, art is what the art world says is art. I mean, you know, and no one, no one thought a urinal could be art until Duchamp decided it was. <laughs> and Andy Warhol had these famous Brillo boxes. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very slippery distinction because there was a actual painter who designed the original Brillo box mm -hmm. for a company. And Andy Warhol thought that was a great piece of kind of pop art. He painted it, made a sculpture out of it. Why is one art and the other isn't? I mean, an art critic named Arthur Danto said, well, mm. you could call one commercial art and the other is, is art art. So again, getting back to that way we love to categorize things and how we categorize things influences how we feel about them. But I mean, someone could probably make a pretty strong argument that the original Brillo box is art, as aesthetically pleasing as the, the sculpture. But Warhol mm. just, you know, took it, thought about it in a different way, asked mm -hmm. a new set of questions. And this is why, you know, art people always say art really shouldn't be about like, whether you like or dislike something, whether, but whether it gets you to think about the world in a new way or, or challenge your own assumptions. But I mean, I think a lot of us do have a, a first response to something, which is very important. I like that or I don't. Mm -hmm. Challenge is to sort of get beyond that. If you, if you don't like it, ask yourself why mm -hmm. and spend some time with it. I want to talk to you about music preferences, but uh, first I'm going to show you a clip from a, a scene from a movie, A High Fidelity, where Jack Black's character, who works in a record store, insults a customer's music taste. A record for my daughter for her birthday. I just called to say I love you. Do you have it? Yeah. Great. We have it. Great. Can I have it then? No. No, you can't. Why not? Well, it's sentimental, tacky crap. That's why not. Do we look like the kind of store that tells I just called to say I love you? Go to the mall. What's your problem? Do you even know your daughter? There's no way she likes that song. Oh, oh, oh. is she in a coma? Oh, OK, buddy. I didn't know it was pick on the middle-aged square guy day. My apologies. I'll be on my way. Bye-bye. <laughs> why do we judge our musical tastes? I've been in record stores <laughs> like that. I spent my whole college um, in, in that. But yeah, I mean, it's. It's funny, I mean, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, this famous French sociologist who thought a lot about taste, you know, thought that music really classifies so much more than other things. I mean, music is a very personal thing. Uh, unlike movies, you know, people kind of listen to music privately. And um, I think, you know, a lot of us first love music in an age when we're forming a lot of um, social affiliations and we decide who we're gonna hang out with in a place like college or uh, teenage years based, based on that music. And you know, these are kind of ridiculous distinctions in some ways, and I remember, having you know those sorts of arguments it's a funny thing where you know though obviously jack black and that character their tastes are very far apart but even people who have very similar interests that's where the, that's where the debates can get really nasty because i mean if you think of like an obscure band mm -hmm. most people won't have even heard of it but for someone to dislike an obscure band they need to know that whole scene to begin with so that's where the people may be very alike, but their tastes are, you know, and that's, that gets, you know, super complicated. I mean, I like uh, <laughs> Lionel Richie. <laughs> is it wrong to say that? Yeah. Um, no, so and, and every, you know, Phil Collins is sort of having a kind of a moment of uh, people are kind of into Phil Collins again and yeah. thinking again about his career. So, you know, who, who knows? I mean, it, it's, uh, well, we'll stop there. <laughs>
we'll talk about that off camera. Um, to what extent are music genres a form of social distinction? Yeah, again, I mean, kind of getting back to what we were talking about omnivorousness, um, I, I, there are people who will decide they only like a certain genre or do not like a certain genre. And um, there are certain genres that are still, even the people who claim to be very open-minded, they will sort of not touch. I mean, maybe, you know, kind of, I use the example of the insane clown posse, which uh, mm -hmm. has, has a pretty strong group of fans. And these are fans that really feel like not only that music has been rejected by everyone else, but that almost they have been rejected by everyone else. Who are and, the insane clown posse? Uh, this is kind of, um, you know, well, it's a, their fans are called the Juggalos. It's sort of a, you know, I guess they call themselves Horrorcore was one uh, one genre name that was invented. Kind of a, you know, a, a rap group that drinks uh, Fago soda and wears and clown fame. makeup and yeah. uh, from the Detroit area. And, you know, um, I, I don't really know much of their music at all, but it interests me. Their albums have sold actually quite well. They've outsold the Arcade Fire on independent labels, um, but you know they, they really evoke a strong reaction, a negative reaction from a lot of other people, yet an equally strong positive reaction from... So it's like people have used that group as this way to situate themselves in the world and, and in, in opposition or in you know, relation to other people. So I, you know... Why might liking like the Insane Clown Posse be considered as having bad taste? I mean, I, I try to stay away from it. I feel like, you know, good taste or bad taste, there's nothing, I really think there's nothing inherent about it. It's just some group in some society at some historical moment mm -hmm. decided what was acceptable to like and what was not. And that changes all the time. I mean, we can see, I mean, we were talking about the Impressionist was considered the, 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 the absolute pinnacle of bad taste, of unacceptable art. And yeah. now it, you'd be considered a refined person if you know you had an impressionist painting on, on your wall that would not be an act of bad taste mm -hmm. um, this stuff is always changing it's always open to reinterpretation stuff can go away and come back um, but I think you know good taste bad taste another way that people are trying to, to put labels on people distinguish themselves um, often with a very kind of like subtle strategy in, in mind um, you know and do you think that also has to do with like community because, like, as you mentioned, with the insane clown posse, maybe they consider themselves outsiders, and then with them, like with the other people that like that music, it's forming like a, a social network. Yeah, that, that can be a very. I think insane clown posse, in some ways, where they have these gathering of the juggalos, these mm -hmm. sort of festivals where they get together, and it, it almost gets back to these kind of you know, almost traditional meanings of music as ways to bring together a village or something, and they're kind of creating the, these villages. And it gets back, to, we were talking about conformist distinction, this idea that people want to be like one another, but they also want to be a little bit different. And they've done studies where they've looked at certain subcultures, like people, um, I think with, with piercing was one, one idea. And the, I mean, when you get a subculture that considers itself very distinct from the mainstream, within that subculture, it actually becomes very conformist. Even kind of a very, you know, a person who seems to be going against taste, they're, they're, they have their own set of tastes that are very strong. And if you don't, like, match the exact uh, conformity of that group, you know, that can create sort of a disconnect. Um, what about politics? Do you, can we draw a correlation between a person's politics based on their favorite genre or artist? There's been some interesting work done uh, by a company called the Echo Nest who uh, Spotify purchased, and they, they do a lot of music intelligence. They call it analyzing things uh, like people's playlists and then linking that up with Facebook likes. And, mm -hmm. you know, there have been some correlations drawn. Uh, Republicans in the United States seem to, you know, prefer country music. Uh, more Democrats like hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, some things don't seem to really predict much of anything at all. The Beatles are sort of so universally liked. It could, it could go either way. Um, my, one interesting thing to me was uh, metal was also very unpredictable because you could have kind of many different ways into metal. There's many different types of metal. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, that from the Echonist, they were looking at music genres. There's two music genres. One is called, these are kind of very uh, obscure forms of music, let's mm -hmm. say, but one is called uh, hatecore and, <laughs> and another is called vegan punk. And hatecore is like sort of right wing, like, you know, it, Vegan punk is kind of like left wing, you know, vegan. Okay. The music actually sounds very similar, but obviously the lyrics to those songs are very different and the people who like those sorts of songs are very different. So uh, that's just, you know, all sorts of interesting correlations that can, that can be drawn though. And um, one, another, just one last thing that stuck mm -hmm. out is that, that Pink Floyd 
Uh, later Pink Floyd seemed to be liked by slightly more Republicans, and then kind of earlier Pink Floyd was more uh, Democrats. Again, this is the United States. But, uh, <laughs> Do you think that um, is like are conservatives more open to one genre or Democrats? They show that Democrats were were more kind of um, open to, to new you know new genres. H had more genres kind of in their in their playlists. Um, and which... critics, you know, how how useful are critics in discerning what's good or not good? I mean, a lot of people say that nowadays with, you know, Netflix and Amazon and, and Yelp and the rise of this user-generated content that, uh, you know, critics are not necessary. We have more of a democratized, everyone can chip in their voice. But mm -hmm. I still find it very useful to, I don't think a critic will, you know, sway me to see a movie one way or the other. But if I see something and I'm trying to, you know, get some context for it, that's something that, you know, how do I feel about that? I, I do enjoy, you know, certain, kind of going back and reading what someone else thought about it. Someone who's really, you know, thought a lot of, spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about movies. So I, I, as, as we have more choice in the world, in some ways, I think critics actually become, become more important to help us just kind of cut through some of this stuff that's out there. And I, it, one of the things that you wrote in your book that I found really interesting was how before um, with Netflix, people might say, you know, I watch documentaries and this is what I like. But when they looked at their algorithms, people were actually watching like the action movies and the film. So why can't we be honest about what we like and don't like? Yeah, I think we, with everything, we, we, we have sort of an idealized version of who we are. I mean, maybe the things we think we should watch, or even the food we think we should eat that we don't always necessarily eat. We all have our, our guilty pleasures. And uh, my own, you know, with the DVD queue and my Netflix is filled with a lot of things that I haven't gotten around to. I've had films sit in my house for a month and a half and kind of, I feel really guilty that I'm not watching them because they're, you know, some long kind of film with subtitles that is going to require a certain amount of mental energy and I really, end of a long day, I just want to like go to the instant streaming and find something I've already seen or some kind of action flick or something. So I, I, but I think you know, we, a lot of us, the whole point here is that you know, a lot of us have many different sets of tastes and you know, we're not easily reducible to, to one thing. But these, all, all these online services, if you go to, to Google's ad preferences site, which I recommend that you do, and, and Google will predict who they think you are based on all the web searches you've done. And when I did this, it showed me to be a 25 to 34 year old male, with uh, you know interested in action films and smartphones and some other some other things. And I, I was looking at that, I was like, well, you know, I'm 47, um, <laughs> so you you got me so wrong, Google. And then and then I thought like, well, wait a minute, they're they're actually looking at what I was into more than actually who I was. So maybe my tastes are just kind of that of a, a younger person. person. So, <laughs> so I'm acting, you know. I, 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 should start, your... I should start acting my age, is the point, I guess. But uh, um, Age is just a number. So. Um, I, I tried doing that, and it blocked me. So I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in Canada. But I, I use Or the... you have some pretty crazy <laughs> search histories on that. that it's like, thing. we yeah, can't figure I mean, you yeah. out. Uh, you mentioned, uh, like, uh, Spotify and Google Play. How f effective is technology at matching people to music? It's, it's getting a lot better. I think in the beginning, uh, Spotify would play their radio stations, and you, you'd get kind of a circularity problem where you you pick, you start a Beatles station, then they'll play you a George Harrison solo station, then they'll go back to the Beatles, and you know they don't. It's always hard to tell you know where a person's coming from, what they're actually looking for. But with this Echo Nest acquisition, I think they've been getting some more interesting playlists that will take you a little bit outside of your comfort zone, maybe make a little bit more. Uh, you know, spontaneous, serendipitous um, choices that, but, you know, again, people are, 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 want different things at different times. I almost wish sometimes you could have a little, like, set of dials where you could say, like, you know, I'm feeling very adventurous right now. Mm -hmm. Give me the Beatles, but then give me something very different. Um, so uh, these, are, these are problems that these data scientists are trying to figure out. Um, sometimes I use the example of, of the song We Are Young by Fun. Mm -hmm. This showed up on, on Pandora in the US a couple of years ago. And it was sort of liked by a certain number of people, but it wasn't a hugely successful song. Then it mm -hmm. appeared in Glee, and it brought a whole group of new fans in who wanted to hear that song. But that was a very different group of fans than the original fun fans. So what, what are you playing next for them? Are you playing something kind of within the Glee universe mm -hmm. or something within the original fun universe? And this is a hard thing for a guy sitting in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. in front of a computer to try to try to figure out, but you know, they're, they're trying. Do you think that these services will become substitutes for critics, like music critics? Now, again, I think, I mean, I, I just um, spent an evening talking with a guy, Ben Ratliff at the New York Times, who's mm -hmm. a critic who wrote a book called Every Song Ever, and he, it's an interesting take where he, talks about how we, now we can listen to everything in the world, right? So how do you, how do you go through that? There, mm -hmm. 
there's a service called Forgotify that has songs that have never been played on Spotify, not even once. There are four million songs on Forgotify. Wow. So <laughs> that's, that's all. Insane. I don't have time left in my life to listen to all those songs. Yeah. So. So Ben, you know, kind of, he'll pick a theme like um, silence or something. He'll give you just a way to listen to music. And then his playlists are very eclectic, going across genres and stuff. But it just, just thinking about new ways, now that you have all this stuff, it, it doesn't necessarily work to do it the old way, just play one album after another. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot more interesting things you can do. You can draw from everything. And you just almost need to be more creative. And critics are the ones who have, you know, some of these chops to kind of think in those terms, I think. What I found fascinating, you write about, um people who enjoy art or music, ironically. Um, guilty pleasure, camp, whatever you want to call it. How did this form of taste develop? I mean, Susan Sontag, the, the American you know, intellectual, was the first person to talk about camp. I think she said, you know, one, once we had gotten, you know, Western society become sort of like wealthy enough and had enough leisure time that we, we, were no, we had enough good stuff already. Mm -hmm. It was almost like we had a little leftover energy and we wanted to think about what, you know, maybe Maybe it's fun to also look at some bad stuff and whether we actually like it or like it in some kind of complicated way, like ironically or hate watching. They talk about in the United States, um, you know, uh, camp. I mean, camp really does stem from enjoyment, I think. And it, it's one, another one of these things trying to get beyond simple questions of good, bad, like, dislike, and, and how things can be really complicated. You know, I, certain things I like. Do I think it's the best film ever? No. Is it a, is it a fun thing to watch on an airplane on a Friday night at home, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's many ways of appreciation that I think always to, don't think always have to be about absolute quality or matching some kind of perfect uh, taste profile that you have. Would you um, say it's like an evolution of taste? Yeah, it's sort of you know like uh, taste plus or something. I mean, I don't know. It's like it's kind of like you know. I'm trying to think of, a, think of an example here. Because um, in the book know, you mentioned that there's actually. Um, there's this website for bad art, what's considered bad art. Yes, in Boston, the Museum of Bad Art. And yeah. I, and I, and, and, but what's funny about this guy is he, you know, he doesn't just collect anything. He has, a very set, he has a very strong set of criteria for what is good, bad art. Um, you know, he doesn't just take velvet Elvises off the sidewalk. You know, it has to be something where he thought someone really tried, had an interesting idea, and maybe, maybe failed for some reason, or ju it just spoke to him in some way, which I think is is key with a lot of these things. You don't necessarily know how you feel about something in the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and fMRI research has, has shown this, that you show pictures of people, pictures to people of people they do not like, certain parts of the brain that are activated are the same exact regions that are activated in an act like uh, feelings of romantic love. So in some ways, you know, this old cliche of there's a thin line uh, between love and hate are, are perhaps you know, actually true. So a strong reaction, it might be, we're not sure yet, but we know we're going to feel we're Something. either going to love it or hate it, but in the beginning, it might be a little unclear. Um, uh, and when, when we talk about these terms like hate watching, guilty pleasure, et cetera, to what extent has taste lost all meaning? Um, well, I just I mean, guilty pleasure, I, I feel like we need to unpack this mm -hmm. a little bit because I, mean, I, I find this is, you were asking before about, about good taste and bad taste. And guilty pleasure has been one of these strategies, I think, where people who were thought they had the good taste. We're trying to kind of control other people's behavior by, by stating what, what should be a guilty pleasure. And mm -hmm. if you go back to the 19th century when the novel was coming out, I mean, it sounds kind of funny now, but the novel as an art form used to be considered kind of a frivolous thing that, that women in particular were doing. Like the men were reading mm -hmm. uh, serious philosophy books. Women were reading these. I mean, like Jane Austen was considered almost like a romance novelist today. Mm -hmm. This was kind of lightweight stuff. And so I, I did this experiment where I went to Shutterstock, the photo stock imagery site, and I typed in the word guilty pleasure, the phrase. And the whole page was filled with uh, images of, of women eating chocolate. So, I mean, and you talked about chocolate before, but <laughs> like that, you know, that, that, what's the social message there that, you know, women should not enjoy sweet stuff? I mean, this is kind of a, you know, this is not necessarily the, the nicest thing to hear. Why, why isn't it pictures of uh, men eating nachos? Or what, what, you know, name another guilty pleasure. I don't know. Um, so, again, it's a bit uh, sexist. <laughs> <laughs> and also, too, the two words, guilty and pleasure, don't really, you know, they're two different things, right? Yeah, I mean, we, this is a complicated thing also. I mean, do you, do you, does some of the pleasure come from the guilt you're feeling? Mm -hmm. Do you, you know, can, again, it's, it's, we could talk for a long time about that. <laughs> well, before you leave, I wanted to ask you, top five on your music playlist. Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> Where's your phone? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> of all time? or no, uh, Whenever, I, however. No, I don't know. I mean, this, uh, I, I have very crazy tastes that are all over the place. But um, I, I love, you know, uh, God, you know, 
Chet Baker and jazz. I mean, I love, um, I love, I, I have a sweet spot for music of my youth, which could range from, you know, East Coast hip hop to new wave alternative, you know, so I mean, anything in that comfort zone. And, and I'm, but I'm always trying to change things. I'm trying to think of a, of a recent taste that I came to like, and I'm, I'm absolutely striking out here. Well, but, um, I was just thinking when you were talking about the likes, how, mm -hmm. um, you know, all these algorithms are deciding what you like, it kind of feels like it takes away the fun from, you know, when you were in the record store, maybe just because I'm old, but when you were in the record store and you could find something by accident, yeah. but now you were relying on someone to say, okay, you like this artist, so then you like that artist. And right now you just said you like things from very opposite genres. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's... There, but it is, the, that stuff does still cough up something that I might not have heard of. Other, mm -hmm. I've had very many you know, pleasant surprises uh, just from a Spotify or Pandora, that, stuff that I might not have thought about you know, actually getting to. And kind of, you, know, you do that moment where you're like, wait, what's this? Yeah. And you know, um, even before you've seen what it is, you're, you're drawn to it. And, and that's really the greatest way to, uh, I use the example of these VW commercials you know, where they will use an artist like Nick Drake, a song like Pink Moon, which used to be a very obscure song, you play it in a commercial, no one knows what it is. They don't know whether they're supposed to like it or not. Who, you know, they have no preconception of who, that it was an English folk artist from mm -hmm. the early 70s. I mean, people don't really love that, right? Um, but presented in this anonymous way, you, you could kind of think of it with an open mind. And it turned out a lot of people really liked Nick Drake, and he's become more popular than ever um, three decades after the fact. Yeah, without any bias, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tom, for helping us understand what it is that we like and why we like it. Thank you. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.